Stanford University. Winter 2010-2011, I'm Andy Freeman. If you're taking the class for credit, please remember to turn in the assignments via we380.stanford.edu. Many of the talks in 380 assume connectivity, or at least connectivity is irrelevant for them. And then occasionally we have talks about ultra-fast networks and things like that. However, every year or so, we have a talk about the challenges of providing connectivity especially in the face of economic or political opposition. Um, political opposition usually being a little more of a problem. Today's talk by Milton Chen and Yunlin uh, Tan is well within that tradition. However, his projects are not just about shipping bits, which has been the emphasis in the past, but about facilitating c communication. Oops. Ooh, I seem to be off. OK. Um, about facilitating communication using video, social networks, and the things that we take for granted in connectivity-rich environments. Of course, he's also shipping more bits than they were doing. Um, with that, today's speaker, Milton Chen and Yunlin Tan. Thank you so much. So uh, the title of my talk is Design of Collaboration Systems for Refugees and Humanitarian Operations. I guess we're sort of unique in the company. We are a typical like Silicon Valley startup, but a huge number of portion of our company staff have actually worked in refugee camps, ranging from Middle East to Africa to Asia. So specifically, we're going to talk about three systems today. One is a video collaboration system. Then the second one is an interactive broadcast system that can interact with Facebook, etc. And finally, it's a specific social network to deal with the challenging our network security that you might find in the refugee situation. Uh, my name is Milton. I'm the CEO of the company. The Yuan Lin runs our engineer of the uh, shop. We also have Penny here with us. So she does a lot of field deployments in there. So the background for this is, in fact, I did my PhD here. So this is bring back a lot of memory for me to come back here to this room. Uh, in fact, when I was, this will go trace back about 10 years ago, when I was looking for a thesis topic, the thing that was really intriguing to me is AT&T invented video conferencing in 1927. And just in contrast, this is the world's first mobile phone. The entire vehicle fuel was electronic. <laughs> but even in 1924, you could have made the car on the road. What was intriguing to me was here's two technologies were invented roughly three years apart. So me as a graduate student, even I had a mobile phone. But video was this one thing. You sort of do it, but it just the impact on everyday life seems to be still limited. And the hi hypothesis was, Part of the reason was technology limitations. The other part was just limited, limitation how we understand the visual communication science. So to solve that issue, this is actually what I built. In fact, this was one of the things, uh, it was in the, just behind there, you know, in the basement, one of the rooms there. So we called the ad hoc video wall. It was meant to make an uh, education setting more interactive. The idea you get three large flat panels, projections, you could get a grid of videos on there. It's meant to be, for example, all of you could be virtual, but even if I interact, I still see everyone. It's meant to be very scalable. So then the other part of the thesis was focused on the psychology. In fact, if you read my thesis, half of it sounds like a traditional video streaming computer things. Other half sounds like a pure psychology thesis. And the reason I had that detour when I was studying this way seems to be a lot of the basic understanding of how people p communicate was very inadequate, all the way from small perception to eye contact to gesture and so on. Even basic parameter like, for example, how, what is the video resolution or how large a video you need to make? In fact, this was one of the uh, uh, findings that actually got me, even as a graduate student, got me to free trips to Iceland, Brazil, and so on. It was sort of neat for me as a graduate student who loves to travel. And the reason this was interesting was, uh, we, the experiments, we display video, we record a video of people smiling on very different resolution, we play them back. And the task is, if you see the person in the screen smiling, they hit the space key. They're able to measure the smile recognition curve. This is, you see the type of knee curve you find with a lot of these psychology uh, 
uh, research uh, findings. And the interesting thing is, traditionally, a lot of time people have these polycon temper, traditional room-to-room -room video conferencing system. People find the experience not very nice. And people always say, how come the experience not very nice? Turn out that if you count the number of pixels across someone's face, because typically there might be six or 10 people sitting in the room, the number of pixels across someone's face is actually like force you to operate in this region, which is actually very difficult to see smell. That's why people feel like the experience is rather poor. And what we also find is if you, once you get into the flat region, like the Cisco telepress and so on, it's very natural experience. Um, but one of the key findings is if you have a high-end webcam, assuming one webcam per person, if you just do the math, you could also operate in this flat region so you could see smell very effectively. And we use smell as an indicator to all these other social cues. Again, there's a tons and tons of stuff that behind uh, this research. So uh, I graduated, uh, once I graduated, me and a couple of folks involved in the project reformed this company called VC. So we've been operating for a number of years. In fact, let me show you a demo. Uh, wait. Okay. I have a couple of colleagues online. Uh, the basic system, you go to vse.com, you click on the download. So we make money out of the enterprises. We support about 6,000 enterprise customers. And for, commercial, for personal use, it's a free system. You just click on the download. And then what you get is, uh, in fact, Eric, I'm going to call you right back, okay? Okay. So the basic system is, is you get an address book, sort of like Skype. If you want to call someone, and just click on their name. Hi, Eric. Hi, Milton. <laughs> Eric, can you share application with us? Sure thing. Here's okay. just a web browser. Great. So now. Once Eric shared this, what I could do, I could click on the pen button. I could sort of annotate. Uh, what I could also do is, I could also, if I hit the control button, I could also take your remote mouse and keyboard control. So work just like I'm sitting next to Eric. And one of the neat things is how you do the sharing is, how you do sharing, any application you bring to the foreground, you see the share button. So if you want to share this with Eric and Gabriel, I just click on this. and. The orange border surrounding the application is an indication to you that uh, remote people could see this application. And then once you share, you could click on the pen, you could annotate. Again, you could do this any application. I could even share, for example, something like a command prompt. Again, any application you bring to the foreground, you click share. A remote person could see this. You could annotate, you could work. Um, then the final capability VC has is a simple way to do uh, file transfer. So, Eric, can you send me a file? Sure thing. Okay. So you notice there's a file just came through here. So you found out uh, what I could do is just take this, let me move this. Uh, I could just drag this uh, file onto my desktop. And now I have this. So suppose that I want to send the file to Eric, I could just take this, drag on top of someone's video, just like how you drag from folder to folder, and let go. This will go through. And one of the neat things about VC is uh, we spend a lot of time optimizing for very network challenging scenarios. Unfortunately, there's no cell phone reception here. So for example, if you have an iPhone, Android, or tethering, uh, if you have, actually that works really well. In fact, um, so we have a lot of deployment all the way from police cars, driving around, streaming video, and so on. Anywhere where you have a cell phone reception, that tend to work well. And part of our work to make a uh, adapt to networks, we could actually do video very, very well. In fact, Eric, can you send your, put your video on a high definition? Sure thing. Okay. So his video is going to freeze for a little bit uh, while during the resolution switch. Um, okay. So in fact, I'm actually sending the resolution a little bit bigger than the, what this monitor is able to display uh, here. So we're actually sending an HD video over a network. The interesting about the HD is most people associate with uh, HD with high-end Cisco telepresent system. In fact, now you could do this very practically. So we have customer, for example, just get a high-end PC with three graphics card output. You could make a do-it-yourself telepresent system, got like multi-screen HD. In the, so this is what you can achieve with this. Uh, thanks, Eric. Okay. So
So one of the strengths of VC is we spend a lot of time not only on the video, but the application sharing piece. Because we see one of the key usage cases for VC is not only see people, but once you see someone, be able to share. So here's a sample of our work is how we're supporting the TSA doing remote airport back screening. So you can load VC on these checkpoint machines and have multiple people watch these x-rays. As well, working on Saudi Aramco, linking VC, connect to the drilling rigs. Again, not only video, but sharing these high-end visualization applications. And because VC bandwidth efficiency, so if you have sufficient bandwidth, we could also give you a lossless application sharing. This is a number of experiment we did with Stanford Hospital and GE. So supposedly use WebEx or go to meeting to share X-ray or MRI. Because they use lossy compression, you can't really do diagnostic with it. In VC, you could say, I want lossless sharing. Then VC would deliver this. And one of the properties of VC is, over the last number of years, we've been focusing VC making work over any type of network. So architecture we have is we take cloud computing principles map to a live video streaming architecture. And so specifically, there's three properties. The first one is a managed peer-to-peer -peer architecture. And right now on the marketplace, you have Skype on one hand, consumer peer-to-peer, -peer, very scalable. But because security and manageability issues, a lot of the enterprise, they can't really work on the, in fact, company like Verizon, they have programs that actively scan your computer. If you have one person download Skype, then your manager get an email note, you just, it's a very awful thing in terms of security. Then on the other hand, you have the traditional Cisco, Microsoft, uh, IBM, client server <coughs> architecture. The problem with that is very difficult to scale. So for VC, what we have is for the control layer, that's client server. So this gives you the manageability of traditional system. But the video, the media, it goes peer to peer. So this makes it very scalable. Then the second idea behind is the quality of how we do the network sensing. In fact, when I was a teaching assistant here, you know, people talk about quality service. As soon as you mention QoS, everybody's in my first instinct is, is about Cisco, which router do I upgrade, all these infrastructure big thing. And the challenge with that is very difficult to scale, very difficult to deploy in practice. What VC does is VC senses the network in real time. For example, right now, uh, at this region, there's, very, there's a lot of extra bandwidth. But over here, because of other traffic in the network, there's very congested. And so VC able to make these adaptations in real time. And so essentially turning quality service instead of a network architecture uh, challenge, turn into an endpoint to endpoint network adaptation issue. And this is one of the properties that makes VC not only you can scale to a large number of people within the enterprise, as well to work over things like 3G and the, some of the network I'll describe in a second. And then finally, just in terms of raw compression, if you compare VC video versus things like Skype, it typically requires only a fraction even at the same level of video quality. So when we started the company, in fact, we had the vision of solving a traffic jam issue. I know you was you probably think it's a little bit naive. So when I came out of PhD, I was thinking, that's the problem I want to solve. And the reason I want to solve that problem is that every morning, right? I mean, if you're like 101, 85 is completely congested. So, but if you think about a company like whether it's Cisco or Microsoft or Google, they all sell plenty of collaboration system to their customers. But if you work for one of these companies, they make you drive to work every single morning. Or maybe you could telecommute one day or two days, but predominantly you have to go to work. Then the question is why is that? Why is Cisco, right, they spent $3.2 billion buying WebEx, they spent $3.5 billion buying Tenber, they have the Cisco telepresence, internally the office, their equivalent of the, uh, their unified communication group has a thousand people. You think all these massive in their butt, yes, you have to go to work. Turn out one of the property is uh, all these tools are designed for very formal structure meeting. You schedule a meeting, versus it seems to be there's lacking something that meant for ad hoc, informal, impromptu work. In fact, the VC, you see that property I see, see multiple people do one click application sharing, one simple drag to do file transfer, what we call C share send. What design specifically came out of our last couple of years we just, we just decided to, even though we have a local office in Mountain View, but we only go to work on Fridays, even for local people. Every, every single day, what we do, we depend on this tool to get work. So over the last number of years, we've been evolving over just 
the, the feature set, this is how we arrive at this seizure sand as the only thing we'll do. Um, so we very fortunately have Jim Gibbons, who was previous on the Cisco board, also Stanford Dean Engineer, sit on board. We also have the Bill Perry, who was the Secretary of Defense on the, for Bill Clinton for six years on board. And the two people below were my PhD advisors, once here that cur currently who serve as company uh, science advisor. So let me now take a detour. Probably this is where the really the humanitarian refugee aspect. So when I formed the company, to be honest, I didn't know any way in the whole refugee uh, scenario. So because one of the property VC is very low bandwidth, you're able to adapt to a uh, number of the network challenge situation. <coughs> we just got somehow to pull into our first project, in fact, was in 2004. It was a humanitarian project conducted by the US Navy. And from there, we just developed, now grew into a large social network of various people. In fact, I'll share with you in a second all the different projects. And the theme for this is always no infrastructure. I'll give you a couple of examples. So the National Science Foundation, they purchased a site license for a product for everyone in the NSF. And one of the product locations they deployed to is the Antarctica Palmer Research Station. Again, very challenging. Sign, you fly scientists there about six months at a time. And they need a very simple way to collaborate with other scientists around the world. And we've been supporting Angelina Jolie connecting with Africa. And also President Obama's inauguration. In fact, let me show you just a couple of pictures we did for there. So this is the command center for the Obama inauguration. I was in this room during the inauguration. This is where they direct about 8,000 police officers during the event. So what you have is they have the command center where they're able to pull in multiple security <coughs> video feeds, as well as they have these individual terminals. So I think you can have very rapid interaction from DC police to the Secret Service, to FBI, Homeland Security. Again, the theme for VC is very simple, lightweight, and fast. What they also did is they also had these command vehicles remotely, and what they were using was using Verizon to air card to connect, able to link the video from the vehicle to people just controlling, walking around, linking back to the command center. And during this event, uh, we actually did tests from Sprint, Verizon, AT&T. We found actually Verizon worked really well in the DC area. So since that event, we've been actually just pulling to a wide variety of projects from almost around the world. So I have actually traveled to Beirut to doing uh, projects there. So this is actually doing uh, this, a microscope experiment. It was actually Charlie in the back there. So again, this, then this is a project I've been to Saudi Arabia a couple of times where they're using VC again for the oil exploration <coughs> project. So I have traveled to Dubai. This again is just, our theme is you could just go anywhere and make the technology practical enough to do the link up. So I've also been to Nigeria. This is where, where there's a lot of terrorism and various activity in there, but it's a very challenging network. Again, it's, in this case, this was a satellite deployment. And we also have done project with Darfur, Rwanda. So in this is a project with USAID, it was an AIDS education where they want to link a doctor and nurses in the US with the camps of provide training in Rwanda. Um, so this we also have done project in Iraq. I don't have any inter interesting picture for there, but I thought the interesting was uh, Burger King looks like in Iraq. <laughs> um, uh, then we also have done this from airplanes. You probably get, if you have, broadband in air, a lot of time it's not, if it's not extremely congested, you can actually do video very well from the airplane now. And this is- Are you allowed to use those in the plane? I think it's strictly if you read, read the rules, you're not supposed to use whatever, but it's okay, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Don't quote me, but okay, we have a lot of people do use that. Because mainly it's people who uh, you have a meeting and various- so. Nobody really knows how they exactly the aircraft stuff, so they just to be on the safe thing, they say no. Yeah, but what's in the well, air? The pilot I mean, can shut you down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's service now. It's sixteen dollars a flight. Yeah, yeah. But <coughs> it's part of that. You just have to. You just have to be on the right airline. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the uh, strong angel. This is a set of exercises funded by the U.S. DoD. Uh, mainly, it's looking how to apply uh, sort of for U.S. military work with NGOs and in a specific humanitarian disaster relief operations. So this is a set up where it was a set of exercise. We went down to a, a big island, Hawaii, to simulate just nothing. So all the way from bringing communication to be battery power, or solar power, all the way out to providing. This is a session where from these tents, 
were communicating with the CIO of uh, uh, DOD, Dr. Linton Wells. Uh, here's some other experiment. For example, you could take VC where these were Wi-Fi antennas. You can actually, all the way from a ground, communicating with the airplane as the airplane making low altitude fly throughs. Again, these are all cases where you don't have your cell phone network, you don't have your satellite, but how can you still maintain communication? And here's another FEMA experiment where you could take a, just a re truck rental, adding these sort of, uh, more powerful omnidirectional Wi-Fi antennas. This will be able to give you a range. But there, as you see here, me and my colleague on the vehicle <coughs> driving around. This is around San Diego. Um, so here's another experiment we did here is a lot of time in the, one of the challenges with the refugee situation is you have to work with a whole bunch number of people right away, able to build trust very fast. Literally, it's every moment you're meeting different people, sort out logistics. In this case, what we did is we actually created, a, made a backpack so you could have a, a tablet on here. So it's very easy for you to take an expert or walk around in this, to so help them make decisions so they can interact with someone. Because one of the things for this a lot of time is you really want that expertise to come in here. Here's the vehicle. Here's the road that's broke down. You want to get that expert advice to help sort out these issues. Um, so here's another set of exercise. This is specifically dealing with if there's a chemical attack. So these set of tents are designed where it is inside pressurized so that if outside there's chemical, this inside your suit could be safe operating here. So they set up uh, ad hoc civilian military air traffic control to coordinate. Then inside here, you see on the big screen, they're using VC again to do link up. This is a case of literally you might be stuck in there for a long length of time, but you still need to be collaborate with people on different locations to work. And finally, this is a set of experiments. This is one of our partner companies. They have this inf inflatable satellite system. You just pop it out. It's like a big beach balloon on there. Then this will give you a global connectivity from pretty much anywhere. Um, by the way, feel free to ask me any questions on this. Uh, uh, then this was uh, one of the exercises, uh, actually real deployment we did. Uh, you probably remember the Asia tsunami a couple of years ago. It was actually uh, one of the first challenges they have is they have a lot of people that are offering to help. But the problem is you might have to work with these people who has, you have never worked with before. So able to build trust with someone who said, this person or this group, they will deliver what they promised to do was actually very critical. So it turned out for them to be able to see and share was a critical, just able to build trust and to get their work done here. So you see, this is actually the op center where they're coordinating all the food operation for the victims. Uh, and then this was one of the projects we got involved uh, last year. So we've been working with the UN uh, refugee agencies for the last two to three years. And each year they have a uh, major worldwide event to bring awareness. That's helping in June. So for last year's events, it actually was, plan was a link video into the, ref, into the uh, United Nations Pavilion in, the, um, in Shanghai. For this one is, in fact, let me just. Having a home, a place where we belong, a place where we can safe, Oops, sorry. Okay, so this is what you saw there. That was Angelina Jolie, so as a Goodwill, UN Goodwill ambassador. So each year she participated in this event. That was a video just mean to be race awareness. So for that trip, we actually, uh, we started out in Malaysia. So this is where you see the contrast. So this is a world famous landscape. But they also have a number of um, people. Literally, these are the refugees, where typically you have a, maybe a two bedroom place. You might have about 30 to 50 people living there because they don't have legal status, so they can't really quite get normal work. It's meant to be this sort of below the seams. So the thing for this is most people think about refugee camp as this sort of camps in there. But turn out today, more refugees are actually mainly interleaved with the cities. A lot of times they walk on the street, you wouldn't know they're refugees, but then they're literally all intermixed in there. So this will show you what the condition is like. So these are actually from the, uh, the people we met on that trip. Uh, they typically, because they can get legal work, uh, so they will make various things like toys, other stuff. This is how they can make, uh, get some money to uh, make a living. Um, okay, sorry about this program. <laughs> uh, this will show you the, actually the setup for this event. Again, is we just have a simple laptop with webcams and these uh, wireless microphones. And the goal is able to beam a live video back to 
Okay. Okay. You're able to beam a live video to anywhere else. You can interview these refugees about giving them voice, for otherwise it might be hard to uh, have. Then the next place we went to is actually Syria. So we went to the specific, this is on the Iraq border. Uh, so this is what travel the UN. Uh, this will give you a sense of what's it like if you're actually on the Iraq border in Syria. Uh, and most of these people typically is, um, they're pretty much, uh, is a man is missing uh, from these. These are mainly refugees coming from Iraq. And the woman the, is illiterate. And they typically have about, uh, uh, five to seven uh, children. So in fact, this is show you one of the families we met there. In fact, this is typical the uh, livelihood is there, and they're mostly is living off the um, uh, UN support because again they're not they're not they don't have the training. They couldn't really get jobs in there, and the whole area is really is very desolate. They're literally driving there just essentially desert came out there. But it was sort of fun, you know, there are a lot of people is really, really friendly in there. So you see, we're driving in there with this kid came out to show him the, the rabbit he had. It was really, uh, the people always, and you see this kid, that she actually had a, a watch that's actually, so we actually brought them some pants in there as gifts <laughs> there. Um, and then finally, here's the setup, you see. This is where, in a typical home, we went there. So we have the big end satellite, so it's roughly the size you can print on your backpack. The whole idea here is, is okay. Sorry, let me stop. Okay. So the premise for this one, we made this thing, which was meant to be a flyaway backpack. So you take your backpack, and it has everything in there from the satellite equipment, the big end satellite, to a laptop plus audio video equipment. That means you could go anywhere in the world, take this out there. You could actually have live communication there. Like a transceiver. Yeah, yeah, give you a satellite connectivity, give you a bandwidth, yeah, network. So this, for if you when you go a lot of places we go to, there literally there is no network like on that Iraq border. So then this is where you literally you don't need to depend on anything else. And typically this one has about eight hours of battery life, so you can literally go on there do a whole day of session without not require anything else. Is that expensive? Yeah, yeah the bandwidth, the device itself is very cheap, but the bandwidth is very expensive. So for this one, we're fortunately the uh, the uh, immersed side, the company runs this, they donated the bandwidth for the CDN. Yeah. Okay. That was it. Okay. So the, uh, the that, that particular unit uh, costs about two to three two to three grand, and bandwidth uh, without QoS, so best effort, three to four hundred kbps is about five bucks per megabyte, um, and yeah. With QoS, uh, it's about anywhere from you know five to fifteen per minute. Yeah, yeah. per minute. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You think that? Yeah. yeah, this is our, one of the deployment uh, for this is really, for example, you have a scenario that there. You need to just go there. There is nothing there. So this is really meant to be is for your forward deployment folks. You can get there, set up the linkage. Then after that then you can set up more like this, more like Vsat, some other stuff, which is actually a lot lower cost. But the nice thing about this is literally just you take your backpack, everything's on there. You don't even need to check in luggage. You can go anywhere, but take this one out there. These things are very simple to set up. Then this will give you global connectivity. And the reason that took us to, uh, okay, sorry about this. And the reason that took us to the Iraq border was because of Hillary Clinton wanted to do a, it was part of the UN events. This was doing a global video sessions where she connected to, uh, to uh, Syria, to Congo, and to here. This is a United Nations uh, High Commission on Refugees. So the idea is you could be in this refugee's home on the border and stream up to Washington, D.C. here. So this, this, this have a linkage. 
So one of the themes we did for this, a lot of time people do these events is they want a way to able to reach a lot more people, not just do a point-to-point -point video link out to get people physically there. So we had a lot of requests who say, could we just make it global where anyone in their home, they could also participate in these events. So for the VC, what we build is, we're not a broadcast system. What we have done is we did a backend integration. So in this case is the singer actress Mandy Moore. So she was in Ashton Kutcher's studio in LA, connected to UN staff in Washington DC and New York. So it was three-way video conversation. Then this whole conversation was pushed out onto Facebook. So you, for example, go into the uh, Nothing But Next Nets, this campaign going on UN uh, on the Facebook page. Then you could just uh, watch this three-way conversation. What we did for them, we also added Twitter and global text chat support. So the idea is when you watch this video, it's not just you lean back to watch this video. But you can actually lean forward to participate, inter engage with this video in the, the panelists. And the architecture for this, again, is on the front end, VC is able to sub just sync in a wide variety of different type of network from 3G to satellite to a uh, network. But there's an interface into your broadcast system. This is where our API will interface with. Again, we can work with any video broadcast system, whether you stream, live stream, and so on. Then through there, it's also tossed into the internet broadcast. And then this is how you can interface into your own web page or Facebook. Yeah. In fact, let me show you one video of what this looks like. Uh, So this is a, uh, there's a group called Playing for Change. Do you get, does anyone know this group? So they actually have this massive following on the internet, like millions of. So what they do is uh, they took uh, musicians, mainly street musicians from different parts of the world, and they actually mix uh, uh, audio and video together. It's just, it looks like these musicians playing together. It's beautifully done. I highly recommend it's out there. It's called Playing for Change. They have huge following. And recently, just did a song on John Lennon. You can mix it up. On. It just, they have huge endorsement from celebrity, all these in there. What they um, want to do is they also, part of this way, is they also set up music school in different locations. One of the music schools is in South Africa, Cape Town, where I went to to help them set up this linkage. This was about a couple of months ago. And so what this session we did is actually, it was a live link up from MIT campus to a township in South Africa, then that idea you can link up. So we see this is a screenshot um, of the actual events. So on the left hand side, you have the Twitter feed, people talking about this thing. On the right hand here, you have people using text chat to interact, so it's meant to be very interactive. Then in the middle, you have these two-way video, and this is again, just push out. <coughs> Let me see. So you also hear, like, for some of the, this is a, the musicians playing from live music from Cape Town linking together. Uh, okay. Okay. Let me do this. Um, I'm going to now turn the floor over to uh, Yuan Lin, who's going to talk about one of the, like, the newest projects that his spirit heard in specifically how to make social network work over these type of uh, projects in Darfur. <coughs> and let me turn this floor over to him. Okay. This one? Should be on already. Okay. Okay, don't touch it. Okay. <laughs> Just copy uh, updates I was making while Milton was talking <laughs> to the desktop. In fact, while he's uh, sharing this, I think maybe I got share a story with Yuan Lin, so I think uh, we as a company are sort of unique. We are sort of Silicon Valley, like a venture back, that type of style. But Yuan Lin, before he joined VC, actually he was working on this project using his own money. He had traveled to Darfur, in Chad, in there. So we have this team of folks who is actually just, literally it's, it's like, you think of software engineers that are programming, right? That's how we do it. These actually set of people that actually, um, they have a day job, uh, at that time working on VMware. Then the evening, just volunteer time to work on these projects. Then they use their own money, get on the airplane, actually go there. You can see some of the, it's a very harsh condition to go in there. And, um, 
And also Eric, you see on there, he has also been to Chad uh, a couple of times. Also Gabriel, you see there, that's also one of the main person behind it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so mainly it's based on the VC. It doesn't give you any hard limitation. Mainly it's a bandwidth and your CPU low. So you could get maybe like a dozen video if you have sufficient bandwidth. But if you do these type of refugee work thing, a lot of time the bandwidth is very limited. So three or four is probably the maximum you'll get. Compress the video? What's you that? Compress the video? We compress the video a lot. In fact, we probably compress more than any, like compared to Skype things. In many cases, in fact, how we got involved with projects like Angelina Jolie or Hillary Clinton was always, the first instant, let's use Skype. Then they were trying to use Skype, but it's just, the quality was so poor, they just said, we can't use it. Then they say, like, is there any other solution? <laughs> then that's how, we, in fact, how we got pulled into these projects. Okay. okay. All right. Thanks, Milton. Uh, so um, I'm Yuan Lin, and I work at VC in the engineering group. Uh, so at VC, we, I think the, a lot of the team is really just interested and passionate in uh, human communication. Uh, of course, in, in the commercial sector, but also in ways it can bring people closer together and ways it can really um, kind of really realize the potential of that phrase, bringing people closer together. Uh, so VC, the VC product is a great synchronous communication tool. It's real time, right? You get on video, you work on something together. Um, at the same time, I think there's also value in asynchronous communication. Uh, as we're all aware, you know, everyone uses Facebook, everyone uses email, and that's a good complement to real time communication both, again, in the commercial se sector as well as in more humanitarian social settings. Um, so I'm going to talk about a project uh, that, uh, that I uh, and a few uh, VC team members, along with some uh, partner organizations, have been working on uh, at night and in our, in our spare time over the past few months. Um, so uh, before that, I'll, I'll say that this is really new stuff, so maybe don't, you know, maybe don't expect uh, any kind of uh, you know stunning, groundbreaking, Nobel Prize winning uh, type of things, but uh, I guess uh, treat this as a as a sneak preview to some perhaps interesting uh, areas that we are exploring in the world of uh, social networking. So first, I'll, I'll spend a few uh, slides on giving some background to why are we doing this. So for about five years now, uh, myself and uh, a few colleagues whom you'll be hearing from later uh, have been working on the Darfur uh, conflict. And uh, Darfur is a, is a region in, Sud in the Sudan, um, about the size of France or Texas. It's on the west of Sudan, neighboring Chad, a uh, population of about 7 million. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty arid kind of desert area, uh, but people there are really great at, um, at making a, a life uh, under those conditions. Um, probably one of the you know, most skilled farmers in the world. Um, so on, here's a, this is a picture of a drawing of a Darfurian refugee uh, child. Uh, of what his village might have looked like. Um, I, I have this picture here because I actually did a Google image search for pictures of Darfur. And uh, the sad thing is actually the, for the first five or six pages, uh, all you get are you know, kind of death and destruction pictures. Um, it's, it's really hard to find pictures on Google of how Darfur looked before the conflict. That is actually a picture of a Chadian village, uh, which would look very similar to what a village in Darfur would look like before the violence. Um, so, the Darfur conflict at a kind of 30,000 foot uh, executive summary uh, type of view, which is what we usually get in the media, in BBC, CNN. Uh, so a seven year uh, counter, counter is insurgency waged by the government of Sudan against uh, Darfurian re rebels, um, which most people, including the US and, and ma many other human rights uh, observers, actually uh, view it as, as not just a counter insurgency, but actually as a genocide. Um, in fact, the ICC, or International Criminal Court, actually uh, has an arrest warrant out for the president of Sudan on crimes of genocide. So 300,000 people have been killed uh, over the past seven years, and as of now, about three million are displaced, many of them for over seven years. Uh, this, it's one of the world's largest humanitarian relief operations spanning both uh, Sudan and Chad. So Chad, Chad is a Sudan's western neighbor, uh, again, 30,000 foot view. So GDP per capita at, uh, you know, uh, at parity about 1,700 US dollars a, um, a year. Uh, it, it currently hosts about 300,000 refugees from Darfur who walked, uh, mostly walked or ran over the, across the border to Chad. Uh, there are 12 refugee camps in the eastern Chad uh, desert where the refugees, uh, even though being expert farmers, uh, you know, able to make a living out of the barest minimum of resources, are largely dependent on external aid. 
uh, pretty much no infrastructure. Essentially, water is water has to be brought in uh, with trucks. Uh, no electricity. Obviously, no you know no high speed internet. Um, in the twelve camps, forty eight uh, primary or grade schools, uh, as we would call it here, and only only six secondary schools. So. Uh, most, the vast majority of kids, uh, refugee kids in Eastern Chad, after after grade school, after primary school, that's it. There's no no more future for them. So I act is the organization that uh, I, I work with, and uh, that's a picture of the team and spouses and kids <laughs> uh, at a recent event. So Gabriel, the founder of I act, uh, on uh, his most recent trip to Chad uh, just about uh, a month ago, um, asked a refugee teacher. Uh, what would you like to tell the world about yourself, your people, your way of life? And the refugee responded, we've been waiting seven years for someone to ask us that, and you are the first, so thank you. Um, so this is really what IAC does. The first trip uh, uh, to Chad was in uh, late 2005. It was a kind of bunch of folks who had no humanitarian experience, no experience, uh, obviously, in this kind of conflict situation, saying, okay, I think you know, we're fed up of this, we're going to try and do something. So uh, kind of <coughs> booked the plane tickets before really uh, doing any kind of planning or logistics on the ground and went out there and kind of made contacts on, on the go with, uh, uh, with the UN and with various other parties. Um, what is IACT about? It's about uh, really the first thing is about adding faces to the numbers. Uh, 300,000 uh, killed, you know, 3 million displaced. Those are very hard, uh, very abstract terms for, for us to grasp. Um, IAC seeks to change that. You know, what, what are the personal stories behind this? What does it really mean in a way that we really can relate to and thus respond to? The second thing is, um, and this has really been, I guess, how the work has evolved. It started with uh, adding faces to numbers. It then evolved to, okay, let's go beyond that. Let's, let's try and let these people speak for themselves to the broadest audience possible using various means, using uh, same-day webcasting, using social media, uh, using live, live kind of a video webcast of the kind that Milton alluded to. The third phase which we are now exploring is, okay, let's, let's go beyond that. Instead of a one-way, you know, letting the people speak to the world, what if we can actually create, um, despite the complete lack of infrastructure, uh, you know, constant uh, relationships, mutually enriching relationships of the kind that we are used to uh, in the first world. And the hunch, uh, and I think, you know, we are starting to see some evidence of this, but the hunch is that once you do that, um, a lot of things naturally happen <coughs> that, uh, that are really good for both sides. Um, and for the, for the people on the ground, bringing about, you know, kind of a different kind of, of humanitarian support, not just the, you know, receive a letter in the mail from CARE or UNICEF and make you feel guilty, okay, send a check, but to kind of really understand, understand what this person is going through, really feel that empathy at a deep level and thus, you know, be able to respond not only much uh, more precisely and much more relevantly, but over a longer time. So that's what IAC seeks to do. So this is kind of Chad and Darfur up close, right? Not, not the BBC, not the CNN. This is kind of uh, what really what we're in the business of. Um, so these are two uh, Chad, uh, Darfuri children, and they also happen to be, I guess, uh, future presidential candidates of Sudan. Uh, so Jimia is 16 years old. She's in the sixth grade. Uh, at Obama School. Obama School used to be called something else. I think the UN called it like School A or something very exciting like that. But when Obama won the election, they, the refugees actually said, okay, you know, we'll just rename the school to Obama School. Uh, <laughs> so she's second in her class. Uh, she lost you know, some relatives in the government-led violence, and she and her family walked uh, four days across the desert to a refugee camp uh, many years ago. Rahma, uh, our good friend, is four 14. He's uh, in grade five. He likes uh, English, Arabic, geography, and math, pretty much all the subjects. Uh, plays soccer, favorite team, Real Madrid, and also wants to be president of Sudan. So this, uh, let me go a bit into now the technology and uh, start segue into that a bit. So uh, 2005 all the way till now, um, I think I act, we, 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 a big focus is, is how can we use the techno technological tools of the day, mash them up, maybe innovate a bit here and there, and be able to kind of bring uh, really interest, new and interesting ways to communicate. Um, so 2005 was kind of the start of it all. Gabriel, the founder, called me uh, somehow. I think he knew my friend and said, okay, uh, I know nothing about tech. How can we do same-day webcasting from the Chadian desert? I was like, mm, okay, I don't know, but maybe I'll, I'll try and find out. So that's how we, we uh, got into this whole Inmarsat began uh, thing, which Milton, Inmarsat is a global satellite, a geosynchronous satellite constellation. Uh, it lets you get a very expensive but high-speed internet from pretty much anywhere on Earth, uh, except the North Pole, I think. Um, so that's what we started doing in 2005, same-day webcasting uh, and kind of manual relationship building, you know. Uh, go to a school here, okay, record you know, videos of the, the kids sending messages to the refugees. 
go to refugee camp you know, at great cost and expense and risk, uh, uh, show those messages, record responses, you know, come all the way back. And IAC team has done that since 2005 about uh, nine times. Uh, one time caught actually in a, in a Chadian coup attempt and you know, she like being almost like being in a movie. I wasn't there thank thankfully. Uh, so in mid 2007, the third trip to Chad, we started thinking, okay, you know, this is this is great and all, but um, I'm sure we can do better. What if we can stay in touch with uh, these with these folks, uh, not just like twice a year, but all year round, right? What if we can um, kind of stay in touch in the in a in a much more cost effective and uh, agile way? So we started thinking about, okay, what 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 can we build? Uh, the first idea was actually to build a distributed uh, video messaging app. Um, Pretty much think of an email client, except much, much more simplified, um, able to operate completely offline, so you know not cloud-based, and uh, and uh, obviously uh, able to send and receive video messages very easily. Um, around mid 2009, we started uh, exploring uh, using the VC technology to do live webcasts and live video interactions uh, from the refugee camp. So we did a global event, uh, World Refugee Day 2009, where we. Uh, did a almost I think it was a what three two to three hour or webcast from the camp you know the the IAC team actually like walking around satellite modem in hand you know probably some cancer risk you know right? but walking around and uh, you know just like getting uh, letting the world really experience life in the camp right so the kids playing soccer you know the families cooking their meals uh, and and of course interviews as well the refugees to really get their thoughts on you know what what are their hopes and and, and dreams. Uh, that was mid-2009, so that's the start of what I call a kind of direct uh, synchronous uh, interaction. Uh, in Oct October of last year, we kind of, we were, you know, it had been a rocky road getting the uh, distributed vis video messaging app uh, deployed for various reasons, which I won't go into. Um, but we kind of reassessed, okay, the, I the basic idea and realized that I think for what we're trying to do, which is really build community, um, uh, it, it makes a lot more sense to build a social network than it is to build a kind of one-to-one uh, a video mail client. So uh, social network, and I think there's a, there's a, lo um, a lot of value in um, the communication being a bit more dispersed. You know, uh, people who were not necessarily the recipient of a, of a message, of a, of, a, you know, of a communication, actually seeing that and, and uh, being able to participate in that. So there's a lot of, I think, community building uh, properties which a social network has, which a video mail client does not really have. So we decided, okay, let's, let's rewrite this thing. Uh, of course, you know, uh, December last year was, was the next trip to chat. So we had about uh, two, three months to, uh, to design and, and you know, implement this, this uh, application. Um, it was actually successfully deployed, uh, you know, uh, pleasantly surprised by that. And uh, to one, chat in, one school in chat, uh, which is now connected to 15 uh, US schools. I'll show you in a second. Um, Okay, let me move on. So what is ComKit? What is this social network we're talking about? So it's a, it's a simple uh, distributed and end-to-end -end social network for really hard to reach communities. I'll explain a bit more what I mean by that. So simple. Um, so this is, this is kind of the basic UI. Uh, you, you all probably re recognize the kind of standard feed structure, you know, post your message up there. Uh, but it's, 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 it's really the bare basics, right? It's, it doesn't have like, you know, your Farmville and uh, ads and you know, things like that, right? It's kind of, okay, what, what, what do we want to get done here? We just want, we want to communicate with people, right, in a simple and, and safe environment. So the UI, the UI follows along those lines. Um, you, you probably can't see it, but below the, the text box up there, there's attached pictures and attached video. And the idea there is uh, we, we want to try and be the kind of simplest way to upload pictures and video from a camera uh, among even all the social networks out there. We're still, we're still getting there. So, What's, what, is it, what do we mean distributed? Um, so internet connectivity is very spotty and not, not only spotty but very uh, kind of logistically heavy to get on the internet in, in the uh, refugee camp in Chad. Uh, it's, it's really a big deal, right? You have to take out this satellite modem, you know, you have to, uh, you have to point it at the satellite, you have to, turn, you have, you have to charge it first, right? You have to uh, then turn it on and there's, there's kind of a registration process to get registered on the satellite hook it up to the laptop. Uh, it's, a, it's really not something that you want to uh, do uh, very often. Um, also, uh, th there's security risk as well. You know, communication devices are really heavily uh, regulated and monitored in chat. Um, it's a bit, maybe you might say, a repressive regime. So uh, they're sensitive to <laughs> these kind of things. So you don't want to necessarily be having this uh, satellite modem lying out, uh, lying out in the open. Um, 
so for that and various other reasons, uh, uh, in fact, uh, maybe let me talk about a different example, which is maybe more clear, uh, a, a more clear uh, use case. So think of a rainforest where there's tree cover. You can't even get, uh, there's no 3G, no cell reception, there's no satellite. Um, you want to use, so uh, use a social network uh, in, in a rainforest community to connect them to the rest of the world. How would you do that? So one way you might do it is um, to do indirect synchronization uh, via some kind of storage media like a thumb drive or a, you know, uh, a DVD uh, rewritable. So that's a kind of you know, example where it, okay, you really need something that is distributed. Um, distributed basically means that uh, each uh, appliance, as we call it, uh, is, is completely autonomous. So if I have a laptop like this and I, and I run CompKit on it, uh, it's completely, it, it runs on its own without internet connectivity. As and when there's internet connectivity or a means to talk to the rest of the world, then you know, we opportunistically uh, sync, send and receive all the, all the content that has been created. Um, and I'll, I'll go in much more detail on that. End to end, what does end to end mean? So I think one of the insights uh, from our experience working in the camps for a few years is that if you want to successfully deploy technology into uh, this kind of environment that's really infrastructure poor and where a lot of the assumptions uh, uh, we, we, we use when designing technology for the developed world or even the developing world uh, do not hold, you really need to take a kind of holistic picture. You can't view yourself as purely a software shop where you're just going to write the software and someone else will take care of the rest of things. You can't think of yourself just as a hardware shop because, well, you know, oftentimes the software that's on the shelf doesn't quite fit the use case and needs to be uh, customized. Um, you, can, you can't just like, okay, design the software and hardware and then hand it off okay, to someone else to, to, to train and deploy on the ground because a lot of times uh, incentives don't really match and people on the ground, you know, have, um, it's not really in their interest to kind of uh, make your system work. So you really have to take this whole picture of, okay, what are all the little things necessary for a refugee child to be able to use this technology, not just once when, when you're there deploying it, but on an ongoing basis. Um, and some, some things that you, might, you, you would need to consider are obviously so the software, um, the network, um, power, uh, and, and all these uh, little, little devices, right, that really add a lot of value, external cameras, flip cameras, really inexpensive still cameras. And then the on the ground partners, so it doesn't stop at the technology. A lot of it is in the trade. How do you get people to actually use and adopt this system? So what are some applications that we, that are for this technology? Uh, the first one, which actually um, is, is, in, is in progress right now, is what we call sister communities. So being able to connect like a school in Chad with a school in the US, uh, a village in Chad with a town or city in the US or anywhere in the world. Right now, the Darfur Dream Team is a project uh, done uh, between like the, with the NBA, the UN, and various other NGOs. Um, to kind of uh, create sister school type relationships between middle schools, high schools and uh, colleges in the US with uh, ca refugee camps in Chad. And uh, through direct relationships between the kids, um, the kids here support the construction and operation of secondary schools uh, in the refugee camps. So the 225 US schools have signed up and the goal is to actually bring secondary education to all uh, refugees in Chad, which is a total of 12 camps. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, I think, uh, this is high school, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Hawaii. And uh, these two are, uh, that's Rahma, and I think this is Zainab, or Jimia. So another aspect is, uh, oh, by the way, this is, uh, this is kind of an actual post that, uh, that we received recently. So that's uh, Ayolani School in Hawaii posting to Rahma, and that's his reply back to them. Okay, another application is kind of a, what we call like truly global citizen journalism. So I think, I think we like to think that in this day and age, a lot of the pieces are there that anyone in the world, uh, no matter how challenging an environment, can be a citizen journalist and can really shed light on what's going on in his part of the world. Um, I think that assumption is, uh, or that, that assertion is not quite true. Uh, it's maybe 99% or maybe 95% true, but there are still many, many parts of the world Chad, uh, you know, the Amazon rainforest, etc., where there's one thing or another thing that, that makes that not quite <coughs> be possible. Um, I think with this combination of technology and tools, I think we are, we are actually there, if not, if not there, very close to being able to allow literally anyone on earth uh, to, to be a citizen journalist. So what's the, what's the architecture? Um, I think at this level, it's, it's, not, you know, it's not rocket science. Um, so refugee camps on the left are kind of well connected. You know, for example, US users on the right um, re refugee camp connected to the cloud or the internet through, through satellite. 
Okay, so that is uh, the software, our software stack. It's pretty simple. Uh, the same stack runs on every endpoint from a web server in a US data center to you know, a, a tiny uh, laptop in a Chadian refugee camp. Um, any SQL database, any database at all. We wrote the app uh, using Groovy and Gra on Grails, and I'll talk more about that later, why we chose that. Um, and we have, we, so it's, it's uh, I think, yeah, I, I'm actually quite happy that we were able to kind of reuse the exact same code on every node from you know, a server in the US, which is used by a whole bunch of people, down to a, a, a single laptop, which is used by maybe 10, 10 people. Um, OK, so I, I'm going to talk about some of the um, maybe key design points uh, that, or the design goals in, in this system. So one thing is offline operation. I already mentioned uh, why, why nodes need to run, be able to run offline and fully autonomously. Um, uh, how we achieve this is basically all the data all the data and code that you need to use the system is, is cached or runs locally. Um, all, the, all the content that I create, all the content that my friends share with me, and all the, friend, uh, all the content that people send to me privately is cached locally. Um, there's an internode uh, kind of synchronization protocol. By the way, if you guys are familiar or have heard of the social network diaspora, uh, some, a lot of these ideas, there, there's a lot of overlap there. Um, so there's a, there's a protocol that uh, nodes use to communicate with each other to share content. Um, basically, the way we've done it is, um, if you remember that, that software stack and are familiar with the concept of the model view controller, uh, our controller logic is actually uh, used both by the front end code as well as the synchronization code. So you, know, you, you have kind of have that same code uh, modifying the database. Um, whenever a user does something, posts a comment, you know, posts, sends a message, it generates an event. Uh, an event is bas basically has a globally unique ID, it has some data, and it has a, a set of uh, or remote, or remote nodes, basically who's interested in this event. Um, we serialize all events as JSON for easy transmission over, you know, over, over the internet, uh, over a thumb drive. Um, and each node basically logs events uh, and at, at various points synchronizes them with other peers. So I'll go into that. Uh, so basically our uh, sync algorithm in a nutshell, um, we, we, we actually uh, piggyback on the, the application frameworks are transactional semantics. What does that mean? Um, the, in Groovy on Grails, every uh, controller action, if you will, or controller method or function uh, is transactional. That's provided by the framework. Um, so either it, it, it all succeeds or, or all, all fails. So uh, the way we did that is um, we use that is when, when a node detects um, another node uh, online, uh, it, it basically uh, when node 1 detects node 2 online, node 2 tells node 1, okay, this is the last event you pushed to me. Um, and the, the proper, nice property there is that that was the last event which was transactionally committed to the database. So we kind of have you know, really nice um, you know, re replayability and idem potency in, in, this, uh, in this system. Um, okay, uh, internode bandwidth efficiency, really important as well. As we mentioned earlier, satellite is about six bucks per megabyte. Uh, so we never want to send something twice. So we do kind of content addressability by, make, by making sure that every object in a system has a GUID and is addressed by its GUID. So if you have that, you, know, you have that, right? There's no need to, to ever resend that. Um, large objects are split into multiple small events of about you know, 100 kilobytes or so. Um, and so using the, the kind of natural transaction semantics I talked about earlier, um, you know, if, I've, if I have this 10 meg, 10 meg video and I've, sent, I've split it up into this 100K events, and uh, I've sent about half, and then the satellite connection goes down. Next time it comes back up, we just we we, we basically don't resend anything. Um, no UI, Chrome, you know, HTML, CSS is ever sent over the network. Only only content that saves a whole bunch of uh, data transfer. And also we 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 uh, this in the works. The media, all all rich media, pictures and video are recompressed to uh, the appropriate size based on how much you know kind of uh, bad, bandwidth quota or data transfer quota you have left, which can be configured. Um, User experience is, is really critical. Uh, I already mentioned that you know it's uh, the the kind of the complete experience uh, has to be accounted for because any small thing in the in the middle of the desert when there's really no tech savvy user for miles around can become a, a showstopper. Um, so everything from the the way the machine starts up, you know, do you do you go into the Windows desktop and then the user has to kind of okay start a browser and navigate somewhere, or does the machine boot up straight into the app? Uh, I think it's obvious which is the right answer there. Uh, one thing, though, is um, I will say that we, 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 we uh, drastically underestimated our users in the first version of the system. So I think we had this kind of maybe stereotyp stereotypical mental model of, OK, 
um, users being very tech illiterate and not being exposed to this kind of thing before. And we went a bit too far in, I think, the, the hand-holding and simplification. So we actually had um, uh, the, our first UI, I think Milton commented that it looked a bit like PowerPoint because it was very like, okay, this screen and then there's all these big co colorful buttons and you click one of them and then it takes you to the next screen. So very, you know, uh, uh, kind of fixed uh, interaction path, you know. You can only do one thing on one screen or something like that. And we also actually, uh, we, we had a kind of narrated uh, UI prompts throughout the, so on the top right corner there was a, there were recordings of actually a Darfuri uh, guy uh, narrating, okay, now you're at the inbox. To send a message, press the yellow button, you know, <laughs> things like that. Uh, so that took up a whole lot of time and actually in hindsight it was totally a waste of time because uh, when we uh, did this uh, kind of the prototype of a social network and try to deploy that, um, you know, it, it, we, the kids learn so fast. Within a day or two, you know, um, they, had, they had never seen or used a laptop before, let alone a social network. You know, they were posting messages, they were commenting. Of course, typing really slow, but uh, just the, the pickup was just amazing. Um, despite that, I think, uh, I think that's not an ex excuse for bad design and uh, overly complex design. So I think similar to VC uh, in ComKit, we've tried to be as minimal and as, uh, I think the term is one click as possible, kind of barest minimum steps to achieve any task. Because I think that um, it, may not, it may not kill uh, you know, the, the experience, if it's more complex than that, but it surely hurts adoption and so surely hurts like the willingness of people to, you know, start using this more. Um, I, I also wanted to mention that uh, one thing which maybe differs a bit between us and say like Facebook is uh, user safety is, is a real priority. A lot of the content, a lot of the co conversations going on here are, are quite, um, you know, you don't, you don't really want the whole world to see them. Um, you don't really want uh, anyone to be able to know who is talking to who, things like that. So uh, ComKit by default is private, um, and uh, the way that users come into the system is, you know, through a kind of a management uh, management uh, console. Um, even and the social graph, you know, is you can really like just search for anyone, add anyone as a friend. As of now, it's it's kind of a bit more um, uh, managed in that way that we we actually create, okay, you know, these people talk to these people and so on. Um, so I mentioned we chose uh, Groovy on Grails as the, as the platform. Actually, that turned out to be an amazing choice. Um, so here are some uh, kind of messages from our subversion repository, <laughs> just to give you an idea. So this one is, okay, uh, 12 hours or so of work from uh, San Francisco to Hong Kong to Kuala Lumpur. So this was a flight which uh, I went home in December and pretty much was able to implement the vast majority of the synchronization protocol, which I mentioned earlier, on that flight. Um, I think this is more a testament to the great, you know, just the great power and agility of today's uh, cutting edge web, web frameworks than it is to the programmer. Um, on the, the final day that the team was in chat, we still didn't have private messaging, so we implemented that in less than a day. Uh, we implemented kind of video file upload with you know, asynchronous like recompression and whatnot, also in less than a day. Um, pretty amazing stuff. The whole prototype was written in under one man month um, by people who had never used this, this framework before. Um, we, extens we really extensively used uh, third party components, everything from security, authentication, uh, the video processing to the front end, and uh, you know, if I think for anyone uh, developing systems of this sort, you know, definitely the the old advice to uh, kind of don't write your own unless you really have to, you know, that that, that really holds true. Um, that being said, on on the, the synchronization aspect, I think we had the option to use very traditional data, <coughs> database replication uh, type things, but in the end, actually, we made a design choice to implement our own, and that turned out to be actually a better choice because I think rather than wrestle with a tool which was designed for you know, the enterprise data center and try and make it fit in this use case. It was actually, uh, it was actually not too hard to just implement our own uh, internode communication. Um, okay, so what, what are some of the next, uh, what, what, com what comes next in the roadmap? Um, I think we are gonna make another trip out in March uh, and I think we're gonna get a lot of good usability feedback from the users. So to act on those really bring the usability to the next level. Second thing is being able to share across social networks. So from ComKit to Facebook to Twitter and so on will really I think take kind of the value of the system to the next level, get the content out if you will. Um, other things around media, you know, kind of one click being able to uh, attach a video from a flip camera or from a $40 steel camera with one click and post that. Um, as well as I think we're really interested in, in, in the notion of simplified video editing. So the idea is um, you know, if we, we want to allow uh, the kids to kind of produce their own mini, uh, almost like TV shows, uh, kind of like the monthly news broadcast from Camp Jabal in Chad or like 
uh, be able to update funders of the school. Okay, you know, this is kind of, uh, okay, th here's the, the, the update on the construction and here's the update on, you know, our classes and all that. Uh, I think they can do it um, from what we've seen, so we want to put tools in their hands that allow them to do that. Um, so let me show you a video. Um, okay, so this is a video of actually uh, the training that we did. This is just a <laughs> <laughs> Goes the other way. Yes. Message from me. I wrote, it, I wrote it this morning. DDT is our four and three team sister schools program. So this program. Answering for the the send which is gonna uh, uh, arrive me from from I I long uh, high school sorry. Okay, so first you sent to Ayolani, now yeah. you're sending one to uh, Brentwood. Yeah, in Brentwood, Brentwood high school high school. Okay, and how do you send a message now to them? What yeah. do you do? Just I'm gonna answer about uh, his question to me. Okay, yes. and to answer you go to here yeah. to comment. Okay, click. And then you start writing, like you did with uh, Ayolani. Sorry about the lip sync, oh, I don't know what happened. <laughs> right there, comment. What? Uh -huh. Now go to the box where it says here. Okay, now click. Now you back. Back, 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 back. Now you answer the question. Okay. okay um, I'm going to see actually, uh, we only have uh, maybe about a couple of minutes left, but I want to see if, um, so Gabriel, we have Gabriel on VC. Gabriel, are you there? Switch audio, sorry, one sec. Yeah. <laughs> hey Gabriel, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. So Gabriel uh, and KJ in the background actually were on the ground in chat uh, deploying this. And uh, I was wondering maybe if uh, they could speak for a minute or two about their experience. Share that with you guys. Yeah, uh, you know, Yon Lin, uh, I, first I have to confess that I, I didn't understand more than half <laughs> of what you said. Uh, so all the tech stuff pretty much over my head. But uh, uh, that probably makes me like the perfect person to go uh, deploy because uh, on the tech side, I'm a lot closer to the refugees than to Yunlin, uh, so, so it's pretty good. And uh, as Yunlin was saying, uh, these camps are as remote and isolated as you can get. They're in the middle of nowhere, and you have a population 
that has has gone through things that we cannot even imagine and we wouldn't want to even think about. Uh, they, they they've all seen their homes destroyed, families killed. Many have seen mother sisters being raped in front of them, and now they've been living in refugee camps for over seven years, where beyond the physical isolation, they felt forgotten and, and that the world does not care about them. So uh, what this means to them, it, it, it's hard to even express in words. Uh, you just have to see the kids sitting in front of the computer and uh, thinking about their messages somehow flying into the air, bouncing off of something we call a satellite up there, and then coming down uh, and, and, and some kids in Hawaii seeing it and then responding. Uh, th their faces just light up and uh, it, it just goes beyond anything we think of as far as social networking and, and uh, communication means to us. So um, it, it, yeah, it, th these connections are invaluable and, and they're invaluable in, in the immediate, you know, as they're experiencing, but then also just for their spirit and what it does to the whole community in the refugee camps to know that they're connected to something out there that cares about them and, and that gives them hope uh, to continue towards the future. Hey, thanks very much, Gabriel. Um, so I, I apologize for <laughs> going a bit over time, um, but I think we'll, we'll probably uh, you know, wrap that up. Um, just want to thank you all for your time. And a uh, uh, slight plug that uh, VC is hiring <laughs> as well as uh, we're also looking for actually volunteers uh, to help on this, this side project. So if anyone's interested, please come and talk to us. Thanks very much. We'll see. If, uh, I'm not sure if there's time for any questions. We'll be oh, happy. Advantage of being local. Yeah. <laughs> we keep going. Well, sure. Okay. 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 Sure, please. So you mentioned that you manage peer to peer. That's correct. Right. So, uh, I was just wondering, like, Sky encrypts all traffic and there's no sort of uh, hypernode or something like yeah. some nodes uh, that might manage. So, uh, can you elaborate a little bit more on these? Uh, the yeah. yeah, so the managed peer to peer aspect, so when you log in, when you call someone, you do need to go to some server that authenticate against you. So, this is a, could be controlled by it. So, uh, you could take this to your private server, set your private deployment, or when you use our public server, this is we manage that. Uh, then the encryption is always endpoint to endpoint encryption. So we basically use the server to exchange a public RSA key bounce around. Then you have a private 256-bit AES session key that's exchanged between the peers. So essentially, the way you could think of it, when you connect with somebody, with Eric, the okay, well first thing you do is you form a peer-to-peer -peer network link. Then you create the encrypted tunnel between the <coughs> peers. Then after that, all the video, everything else goes through there. Okay. So these kids in Chad, where did they pick up English? So uh, they actually learn English in, in the school. Um, yeah, the, 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 I guess the quality of the instruction and kind of the resources they had, the textbooks and all that, is really limited. So, you know, even though they're really smart kids, like um, I, I, they, they could probably. Um, Learn a lot faster, given more, you know. But they, they do have English classes in the in the camps. So is VC's work mostly in this humanitarian? I mean, the social distributed social network conflict seems most applicable even here. There are many people who for whom the simple video and pictures and the the simple interface is actually very very valuable both in business and in, in social family connection? Yeah. I think for us, is when we formed the company, like I said, it's my personal journey is I was a PhD student here, so I didn't know anything about this humanitarian world. We had the property initially we started out, we just wanted something that very simple you could deploy, but also very secure. So then we just were, I guess, meandered into, almost accidentally got into this set of deployments. I mean, in some sense, our focus is VC, we do want that theme of making things very simple. But I think specifically on the social network aspect, some of the assumptions, uh, things you might not have network all the time in there, that probably, will probably make more relevance to these for that type of deployment rather than you know, at home, like here. Okay. 
Thanks for the question. Another question? Take the, take the uh, microphone from you. And then you'll find out how to start because, you know, remote people always lives out. <laughs> For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.